Welcome to the Straight Way of Grace Ministries informational series, Revealing Islam. The Straight Way of Grace Ministry was founded in 2001 by Usama Dakda, an Egyptian-born minister who holds a bachelor's degree in theology and a master's degree in missiology from New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Usama learned about Islam in Egyptian schools, where it was and still is a mandatory subject. He further studied Islamic law in college. He is now an internationally known speaker on Islam. The name of this ministry comes from an often repeated phrase in both the Quran and Islamic prayers. Muslims repeatedly pray, guide us to the straight way. Christians know that the answer to that prayer is a real and professional relationship with the God who created you and loves you. That relationship is made possible through a personal experience with Jesus Christ. John 14, 6 reads, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Straight Way of Grace ministry travels throughout the United States, equipping Christians to be effective witnesses of Jesus Christ to their Muslim neighbors, as well as ministering to Muslims directly. Christians are equipped for witnessing to Muslims through a series of presentations entitled Revealing Islam, which provides a clear understanding of the basic tenets of Muslim faith as contained in the Quran and the Hadith. The first of these presentations, Revealing the Truth about Islam, provides a broad foundation in the teachings of Islam and how it relates to history as well as the current conditions and goals of Islam in the world. And now, the Straight Way of Grace Ministries premier presentation, Revealing the Truth About Islam. Literally, Muslim people around the world don't know anything about the Quran, which is the holy book for the Muslim people. There are roughly 1.2 million people around the world, billion people around the world, who never read this book. Literally, because they can't speak the language. But they're Muslim. Why? Because they were born into a Muslim country from a Muslim mom and dad, and that's what it is to be a Muslim in around the world. This is a map of the Muslim world roughly 100 years after the existence of Islam. It started here in Saudi Arabia, spread all the way in North Africa, went down to Somalia. They actually crossed Morocco to Spain, and they crossed Turkey. If you remember the Bible, or if you study the Bible, Turkey used to be a Christian country, so is Egypt historically. But they crossed from Turkey to Europe, and their plan was to take over the whole world. But we began around 750 with uh, the people in Europe. They went and fight physical war in Spain, uh, where they stop the Muslim people bringing bring back to Morocco, and in Turkey, the French people have another army war with the Muslim and bring it back to Turkey. And if it was not for the European who fight the Muslim jihadist invasion, you will be here today as a Muslim country. Remember, America came from Europe, and if Europe had fallen into Islam in the early uh, uh, growth of Islam, you will be a Muslim country today, but thank God for the French people, thank God for the Spanish people who wage this war and stop the movement of Islam all over Europe. If you look at the map, one of the amazing countries, I've been there twice, Indonesia, 220 million people. That's more than all the Arab people who believe in Islam. In one country alone, 220 million people who never read the Quran, neither them, neither their ancestors. They are Muslim without Islam. When you talk to people in America, the first thing you think about Muslim are Arab and Arab are Muslim. Only 13% of the Muslim people in the world speak Arabic. Half of, them, half of them never read the Quran simply because they could not read and write. If you look at the map here, you talk Turkish people speak Turkish, Iranian people speak Iranian, Afghani people speak Afghanistani, and almost every country around the world, people speak their own language, except Egyptian. We no longer speak Egyptian because literally when the Muslim came to Egypt, they killed four million of my people and cut the tongue of those who speak the Coptic language. But the rest of the world they still have their own language and they're Muslim. They pray in Arabic without understanding what they're saying in their prayer. When did Islam come to the world? Many people in America don't even know the difference between the word Muslim and the word Islam. Islam is the name of the religion. 
and Muslim are the people who believe in Islam. Christian, the people who believe in Christianity, Muslim believe in Islam. Now let's see where, uh, when did Islam came to this world? We know from the Bible Adam and Eve were created roughly 6,000 years ago. The flood took place roughly 4,300 years ago. Uh, the call of Abraham from Iraq, Ur Kildanin, was uh, 1900 before Christ. We know Moses came to the picture when existing out of Egypt. There's two different dates, but one of them is 1550 before Christ. We know that King David was the uh, uh, second king for the Jew after Saul, the man after God's own heart, 1000 years before Christ. And there's so many prophecy has been put between Adam and Eve and all the way to Christ 2,000 years ago when our Lord Jesus Christ came to fulfill all the prophecies has been given in his Old Testament. And God has spoken through many uh, men in many different ways. And in the last days, 2,000 years ago, he spoke to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And in Jesus, the fulfillment of all the prophecy has completed. But... 610 years later. So Islam comes 610 years after Christianity with the name, uh, a prophet by a man named Muhammad, whom he claimed to be a prophet. And his prophecy is depend on one thing, and one thing only is this book, the book of the Quran, whom 90% or, or more of the Muslim never read, so is American Muslim. all take place in Saudi Arabia. Look in this circle a little bit. In Mecca, Muhammad was born in Mecca roughly 570 AD. He grew up to be a normal man at the age of 40. He went inside a cave and here is the cave by the name Hara. Inside this cave, Muhammad used to go and meditate, according to Muslim scholar. Meditate on what? I have no idea. He was not a Jew, he was not a Christian, he was not even a Sabaeen, some idol worshiper. But one night, he went inside this cave, and he saw a spirit. He ran to his wife Khadija, scaring, frightening. It was a cold night, according to Muslim uh, scholars, that he was sweating from the fear from seeing this vision meeting with this spirit. And he told his wife about his vision, and she told him, calm down, Muhammad, don't, don't worry, take it easy, I, I, I will test it for you. As a matter of fact, right now, if you go to the website, Saudi Arabia website, the Muslim website, and you, you read about the test of Khadija and the proof of Muhammad prophecy. So amazing when you read about all the prophets who came to this world in the Bible, you never see any of this prophet run to his wife and she performs such a test. But in the case of Muhammad here, we see that he ran to his wife Khadija and she told him, come down, I will assure you for what kind of spirit you met, if it's a godly or demonic. Like, just let me, let me show you, let me prove to you. And what she did is she took her clothes off. The spirit was in the room, Muhammad is in the room, his wife Khadija is in the room, and she started taking her clothes off. Do you still see the spirit, Muhammad? He said, no, the spirit left the room. She said, I swear by Allah. This was angel Gabriel, and you are an apostle. You are a prophet. And that is the test where Khadijah performed to prove Muhammad's prophecy. Have you ever seen in the Bible Jeremiah or Ezekiel or any of the prophets in the Bible run to his wife and say, take your clothes off, honey. I want to make sure that it is a godly spirit, not demonic spirit. You never see it there. But that's how Khadijah was able to prove to the world and to the Muslim people that Muhammad is a prophet. Why? You see, if, if there was a demonic spirit in the room, it, the spirit will not leave the room when a woman takes her clothes off. I mean, demons love to look at naked women. But since the spirit left the room, that assured Khadija it was a godly one. But how in the world she know it was Gabriel, not Michael or somebody else? I don't know. Don't forget what the Bible said. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Yes, Muhammad saw a spirit. Yes, Muhammad saw a light. Yes, Muhammad saw an angel of light. Could it be Satan? This is the book of the Quran. If you look in the circle in the middle, you see the name of the Quran. They tell us that the name of the Quran is Holy Quran. That's how they translate it in English. 
Some translate Holy Quran, some translated the Final Testament, like Rashad translation, and some translate this glorious Quran, or some just suppose the word Quran. Is this really the actual name for the Quran if you translate it from Arabic to English? No. So why does he do it like that? See, this, the whole thing about Islam spreading in America is, is grown on deception. Deception starts in the cover of the Quran. When they tell you that the name of the Quran is the Holy Quran, when the word in Arabic did not say Holy Quran. See, they know you Americans are familiar with Holy Bible. Holy Bible, Holy Quran, they're both holy. Is the Quran really holy? The real translation to the name is the generous Quran. So why does he do that? It's all deception. If I give you a container of salt, for those of you who cook in the kitchen, you're familiar with that. And I change the name from salt to sugar. Now the question is, how sweet this salt will be? Still salt. It doesn't matter what you put outside. It's what inside the container. Have anybody in America really bothered to read this book to see how holy it is? I've been speaking now for the last four years full time, seven years, uh, three years before part time, and I have asked this question hundreds of times. And the answer was always, nobody ever read this book. And the question is for you here tonight. How many one of you here tonight have read the Quran? One, two, three, four. American people have not read this book. So it is holy. After all, the whole world get in, uh, in madness and chaos because some soldiers, it was a rumor that one of our soldiers has dis disgraced this book and flushed in the toilet, remember? And all our senators get mad at our president and our soldiers. How dare your soldiers put the Quran in the toilet? And then the result of this rumor, a few hundreds of churches around the world have been burned. And by the way, inside the churches, there was Bible and Christian. And so many hundreds and hundreds of Christians have been hurt. It just was a rumor. But that's how uh, the Muslims react to their holy book. Is it really holy? If you live with every teaching of this book, will you become a holy person? Let me assure you that the teaching of the Quran will not guide one person to become holy. The more you practice the teaching of the Quran, the more far away from holiness you become. Let me give you an example. Marriage. Marriage in the Bible is, the Bible said, it was from the beginning all the way until Christ come back. A man leave his father and mother and unite with his wife, and they both become one flesh. And that's what we call holy union. And what God gathers, no one separates. That's a holy marriage. Marriage in Islam is a little bit different. As a matter of fact, the first marriage in Islam is a marriage to the free Muslim woman. I have studied this in college in Egypt two years. Sharia law, marriage and divorce in Islam. Married to a free Muslim woman, limited to four, if you treat them equally. In the second marriage in Islam, that's a marriage to the concubine. It's not really marriage or slave. What your right hand possessed. The more of women uh, you possess, the, you have the right to sleep with, to live with as a husband and wife. Unlimited number. You, literally, you can buy them or you can kill the men and take their wives or their daughter and they're yours. Islam teach slavery. We talk about this some other time. As a matter of fact, you can sleep with your slave even if she is married to a man because she is yours. That's what the Quran teach. Is this a holy marriage? Let me share with you the third marriage in Islam. There's no, so, so many kinds, which is the third marriage is called marriage for fun. Marriage for fun is the wajil muta, where a man will marry a woman for a limited time for a specific number of dollars. So say I will marry the woman for two hours for 20 bucks, or two weeks for uh, $300, or you can marry for six months for whatever deal you make with the woman. This is marriage. Shia practice this marriage today inside the United States of America and around the world. Prostitution is a holy marriage? I'm sorry, this book is not a holy book. Don't put in it holy name because it will not work, it does not fit. Let me read to you some of the things that have been written on website, Muslim website, www.islam.org. And it says, the glorious Quran is the word of Allah as revealed to his prophet Muhammad, peace be on him. 
There's two words here I'm struggling with. I don't think Muslim people really understood. Revealed and prophet. What is revealed? Something was not there and God revealed. God show up later. That's the word, come from the word revelation is new information in very simple understanding. Do we have anything new in this book? If you have never read it, you don't know what I'm talking about. This book is the counterfeit of your Bible and other stories written in uh, like a children's uh, story you tell them to baby before they go to bed. It is here. This book does not reveal anything new. As a matter of fact, I consider it to be a dumb counterfeit. If you're ever going to do a counterfeit to a dollar, I'm not asking you to do that, but if you ever do that, uh, make sure that the dollar will be the same size. Don't change the size. So you have to keep it in the same size. Okay? Don't change the color of the dollar. Don't make it red or blue. It has to be the same color. And by the way, which president this is here? Washington. Grandpa picture will not work. <laughs> when you read the Quran, it is the Bible in a very foolish counterfeit. It does not even stand for itself. So you read the story about uh, somebody in somewhere in the Bible and read it somewhere else and the story always change. The words always change. That's really a hard counterfeit to, to be swallowed. He said also, Prophet Muhammad. What is prophet? The Bible gave us really good test to see if there's a man is a prophet or not. He said, if the man came and says, thus says the Lord, and then what he said did not come to happen. His prophecy had not been fulfilled. You take this man outside the city and stone him to death. Now, if the same man came and said, this is what God said, and it happened exactly as he said, but he said to the people, well, let's go worship Bala, let's go worship some other God. You still take the same man outside the city and stone him to death. Why? Because God said, I will test you to see if you are faithful in my worship or not. The true prophet in the Bible is a man who says, this is what God said, this is what's going to happen, and what he said exactly happened, but he must lead the people to worship God alone. Now, what is Muhammad's prophecy? What is his prophecy? We've been asking Muslim people for the last 1,400 years, what was Muhammad's prophecy? A prophet without prophecy. He said on reading the Quran, uh, once is at once convinced that it's the word of Allah, for no man can write such perfect guidance on so many subjects. Oh, so many subjects, the generous Quran. Now I know why it's generous, because they talk about everything in the Bible. Creation is there, Adam and Eve is there. Actually, I'm sorry, Adam, Eve is not there. Was never mentioned in the Quran. And how did we come here? I don't know. But it was his wife in the Quran. And, and the story of Moses, the story of Noah, and all the story. But was it perfect guidance as Muslim people claim? For most Americans who never read the Quran, it is a perfect guidance. After all, you, know, you don't know what's in this book. But do you know that through my last two years, I'm working hard to translate the Quran to English, and we praise God, we're almost finished. It's going to be published sometime before Christmas. Many people have serious questions about the religion of Islam. Who are Muslims, and what do they believe? Liberal Muslim scholars and clerics spin the news and continually promote Islam as the religion of peace, and that Jews, Christians, and Muslims worship the same God. But is this true? Where can we turn for the answers? To truly know what a faith teaches, you have to go to the book. And for the last 1400 years, that book for Muslims is the Quran. This collection of the sayings and teachings that Muhammad claimed to have received from Allah is the sacred text for over a billion Muslims worldwide. But the Quran was written in Arabic, so how can we in the West learn what it really says? Muslim apologists have produced several English translations over the years, but these have been carefully edited to hide many of the blatant errors immoral teachings and violent commands throughout the book. In the beginning of our ministry, we decided to tell the truth about Islam. Uh, therefore, we decided to buy the English translation of the Quran to use the verses which is written there. Sadly, I could not find one Quran to present the truth as it is written in the Arabic language. They sugarcoated, they watered it down. That's why we decided to go ahead and translate the Quran from Arabic to English, a true English translation. 
The Straight Way of Grace Ministry, in cooperation with Arab and English scholars from around the world, has produced the most accurate English translation of Islam's holy book ever printed. Read for yourself exactly what Muhammad taught his followers about war and violence, about sex and marriage, about the treatment of infidels, and more importantly, what he said about Jesus. Islam is not what I share with you or what some moderate Muslim tell you. Islam is the verses of the Quran. We must separate Muslim from Islam. There are so many wonderful Muslim people out there, but they are not true Muslim because simply they don't practice what the Quran teaches. So many American people say they accept Islam. They do not have any problem for Muslim to practice Islam in America, but same people rejecting Sharia, Islamic law. Not knowing that Sharia, Islamic law, is a practice of the verse of the Quran. This translation has been produced with the modern student in mind, with several key features including study notes for the reader, detailed notes concerning errors and contradictions in the text, careful comparisons between the Quran and biblical accounts, and references to the original sources that Muhammad borrowed from. Special sections discuss key topics such as a compilation of non-Arabic words and idioms found in the Quran, an easy-to-follow chart outlining the fulfilled prophecies concerning Jesus in the Old Testament, and a challenging gospel invitation to introduce the reader to the scientific, historical, and biblical reasons for accepting the true Jesus as the only Lord and Savior. In the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6, the Bible said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It is time for us to read the Quran. It's time for us to find the truth for ourselves. For ordering and more information, please visit thestraightway.org. Read the Quran for yourself and understand the roots of this dangerous faith. Individual copy and case pricing are available. I could not find one story here in this book taken out of my Bible even close to the truth. They were all corrupted. They were all changed. Let me give you an example. Noah. Noah in the Bible, a man who believed God and uh, for 120 years built this beautiful, wonderful boat and uh, him and his wife and three sons, Ham, Sham, Japhis, and three daughter-in-law and his wife, eight people, uh, they were saved from the flood. That's why we're here. It's a wonderful story. You read it in Genesis and uh, the story is very clear how big the boat is, uh, how long it took him to build the boat and uh, where he built the boat from and uh, how many days the rain was there and what kind of animals he have, how many animals he have, how many birds. And by the way, some people don't believe the story of Noah to be true because how in the world are you going to put all these animals in a boat? That's some of the excuses I heard from people. Do you know how big this boat is? It's the size of a football field. Literally, you can put 125,000 sheep inside the boat. It's a huge structure. Read the Bible and you know how big was the boat. And then the Bible even tells us after the flood, where the boat rested at and what happened to In The whole story is exactly detailed written there in the Bible. Now, let's go look inside the Quran and see what did Muhammad say about Noah. Noah, go to his people. Noah preached to his people. His people did not believe in him, but few people believed in him. And then the water started coming from the sky, and they started rising from the ground. Then Noah remembered, oh, I need to go get the animals. So he went outside the boat, quickly gathered all the animals he can and put them inside the boat. And then he was standing at the door of the boat, and the water lifted up the ship. And he's looking outside, and he see his son, and his son was swimming in the water. And Noah from the boat say, oh, my son, come be with us. Oh, no, dad, don't worry. I'm going to go on the top of the mountain. I'll be okay. <sighs> Swimming. Son, nobody will be safe today. Please come be with us. Oh, no, dad, I'll be fine. Don't worry about me. And the waves came between them. And Noah's son drowned. Wow. This is a story of Noah. Is this a perfect guidance? Is this exactly how the story happened? And then you go to the Muslim scholars. See, the Muslim in America will tell you, you cannot understand the Quran unless you read it in Arabic. That's number one. Number two, you cannot understand it unless you read the Muslim interpretation, scholar interpretation. So I go to check with Ibn Kasir and Tabari and Qurtubi and all this wonderful Muslim scholar, and they tell me, yes, Noah's son drowned, and Ham and Sham and Japheth, they came to existence after the flood. They were born after the flood. But this son who drowned, 
His name was Kenan. And when you read the Bible a little bit closer, look carefully at the Bible, you find Kenan was Ham's son who was born after the flood. Not before the flood. They got the whole story wrong. Believe me, not just Noah, it is every story in the Quran. They're all misguided. They're all dumb counterfeit. How big is the Quran? You see me holding my hand. It's exactly 9.1 compared to the size of the Bible. 9.1. If you look at the number of uh, verses, man, there are 20%. So many verses in the Quran is one word. Sometimes even a verse in the Quran is just um, a letter. K, L, M, R, C, whatever the letters you put. And nobody knows what these letters mean, but that's a verse. The size of the words, you have 13% uh, less words. And the size of chapter, 10% of the Bible. But the real actual size of the Quran is 9.1. It will take anyone to read the entire Quran less than 24 hours. Even though it's a small book, 24 hours, but we Americans don't have time to read it. We're not interested. America, here is the answer for the cancer spreading in your country. Read it and tell your children about it. If American people read the Quran, none will become Muslim. As a matter of fact, you get so excited about sharing the gospel with the Muslim who are lost. They could not even understand a simple story in their book because they don't have the true story of the Bible. Another very important book uh, Muslim people tell you you need to know because if you don't know this book, you will not understand the first book. It's the book of Hadith. And what is Hadith? The word Hadith is an Arabic word which means talk. I'm talking right now. I'm carrying a Hadith with you. Everything Muhammad said is a Hadith. Everything Muhammad did is a Sunnah. Sunnah is a way of life. The collection of what Muhammad said and what Muhammad did is the second source where Muslim people live by. So we got the Quran and we got the Hadith. Did really Muhammad say every Hadith we know Muslims say that he said? Absolutely not. Why? Because simply there are three quarters of a million Hadith. A man claimed to be a prophet for a length of time of 23 years, have all these wonderful wives, 13, and have all these other ones, one night stand, whatever you call them, of 30 other one women, will not have time to talk. Not to write three quarters of a million hadith, or to say three quarters of a million hadith. I'll share with you some tonight, and if you're interested to know more, I would love to tell you later. But everything Muhammad said is a hadith. Everything Muhammad did, people saw it, people observe it, they write it down. That's a sunnah, way of life. They tell us that Islam, by the way, this comes from the United Nations. I have not seen anything the United Nations have said or did right yet. If you know something, share with me so I will not be lying next time when I speak in some other church. The United Nations said Islam is the fastest growing religion and the second largest religion in the world. And both of these two statements is false. They are lies. Is really Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world? Well, let's talk to those who become Muslim and let's ask him how much do you know about Islam and what did they learn about Islam? Does it match what the Quran teach? You talk to any American who become Muslim, uh, up to just yesterday, Saturday, we have another pastor's daughter. She married to a Muslim guy. 20 years old, younger lady, she married a Muslim guy. To marry to a Muslim man, by the way, you have to say the shahada. We're going to talk about the next hour, and that means you become Muslim. You say it in Arabic, you don't know what you're saying, but that's okay. You are Muslim in their book. Does any of the Muslim American believe that Islam is the most hate crime religion to be practiced in the world? No. Here in America, they literally believe Islam is a loving, peaceful religion. We're going to see about that in a few minutes here. Is Islam a loving, peaceful religion? No. But that's how it is growing in America. What is growing in America, not the Islam of this book, it's the Islam of the people, mind, and thought, how they would like it to be. Islam is not what I tell you here tonight. Islam is not what some imam in America and our, through our media will tell you. Islam is the teaching of the Quran. Same as Christianity. Christianity is not somebody stand up in this pulpit here and tell you this is Christianity. Christianity is what the Bible, the New Testament of our Lord Jesus Christ teaches. 
So what's growing in the world today is not Islam. Where are, the, where are Islam is growing? Do you think Islam will grow in Egypt where there are 45, 50 million Muslims there know the Quran? No. In Egypt last year, one million Muslims become a Christian. Wow. In Egypt, Muslim becoming a Christian. In France, just because some lightning have been light up there in France, and people in France start to see, whoa, is this really what the Quran teaches? We have more Muslim in France becoming Christian than those who are becoming Muslim anywhere else in the world. If you really know what the Quran teaches. So Islam is not growing. Baloney Islam is growing in the world. And that's true. There are millions. In America alone, the last five years since September 11, we passed two million Americans become Muslim just after September 11. Why? Because they believe a lie. They believe, for example, that Islam is a loving, peaceful religion. We'll see about that in a minute. It's the second largest religion. Is this true? That's another lie. See, if I tell you that Islam is growing in the world, but after all, Christian is the largest, you don't have to worry about it. We have more people on our side. We don't have to worry about the other side. It is a lie. Why? Because how United Nations know how to count Christian? Do you think United Nations know how to count Christian better or Billy Graham? Well, Billy Graham said 70% of our Southern Baptist members are not born again Christian. First time I heard this statement, I saw this man lost his head. You know, you're getting old and you can't remember. And you say things you didn't even know what you're saying. But the more I travel, the more I speak in churches, the more I find it to be true. Believe me, I spoke in a small church and large church. I spoke in First Baptist Orlando, 14,000 members. And I spoke in churches of 70 people, 60 people. The true number of the believers, not who show up on Sunday morning, but Sunday night, perhaps Wednesday prayer meeting. Where are the Christians? Sunday morning is a good club. You meet your friends and have a wonderful time. The true worshiper who are shown in the time where there's no this big gathering. And I could not see this clearly than prayer meeting on Wednesday night. If you bought anything before God, then this thing become your God. That's what the Bible teach. The number here, obviously, a little bit, as I told you in the beginning, it's a little bit lie. They say they are uh, one and a half uh, billion. I think they are roughly one billion, 200 million. So they are roughly 18%. Do you know how many Christians in the world today? Less than 9%. We're not even half of the Muslim. United Nations count in America all Jehovah's Witness to be Christian, all Mormon to be Christian. Michael Jackson and Madonna are Christian. <laughs> Did you see Madonna have this big cross on her chest? There was nothing, there was no clothes bound as a cross, but she have a cross. And everybody running to the office now to be the president of the United States, they all believe in Jesus now. They all believe in the Bible. They talk about the first week when they start debating each other, and every one of them, I can imagine, holding the Bible in his hand, and they're now all Christian. They're all taking their faith seriously. Every one of them need your vote. The 20 are running right now for president of the United States. 10 Republican, 10 Democrat, they're all Christian. Sadly, let me share with you, I doubt any of them are Christian. Neither party. If you are encouraging or allowed a portion, you're not a Christian. Homosexual, to get married, that's not Christianity. Christian will stand firm and say, that is sin, we need to stop it. We need to repent, we need to get out of it. Otherwise, holding the Bible, holding a cross on your arm or whatever you do is with the, the stuff outside does not make you a Christian. So where is Christian? We are not even half of the population of the Muslim around the world. The growth rate for Muslim around the world, six and a half percent or close to it. Christianity, one and a half percent. Muslim grow up around the world, baloney Islam now, don't take me wrong here. I'm not talking about the real Islam, the, the, the new phase of Islam, the new picture, the new teaching about Islam has been growing around the world the last 50 years with 235%. But Christian grew 47% the last, 30, the last 50 years. Why is it? How Christian is going to grow? Maybe Jesus will come back again and he dons the cross and then the number will grow again. No. Maybe the church, the Christian, 
The born-again Christian will be obedient to Christ and fulfill his command, which we call the Great Commission. I speak in some camps and speak to different uh, age of kids uh, up to high school, college, and I ask, what is the Great Commission? They have no clue what I'm talking about. Do you, First Baptist Biloxi, know what is the Great Commission? Are you fulfilling the Great Commission in your walk with Christ? When did you share the gospel last time with somebody? I ask this question always, and I love to ask you tonight. Who are here tonight as a result of somebody from this church shares the gospel with last week? Let me see the new hand. The new believers in this church result of somebody shares the gospel with you from this church. Can you see one? I right, saw so you guys last week, you were busy, you have things to do. How about last month? Last month, where, how many one here in this congregation right now here, he's a Christian, he gave his heart to the Lord last month because somebody in this church shares the gospel with? Let me see a hand. I'm not going to embarrass you anymore. Go back to last year. Our church in America growing, Southern Baptist, result of split. We need new churches. But are we reaching out, really? Are we going out in our way? In your way, as you're going to work, as you're filling your tank in the car, as you're eating in the restaurant, eating meal, as you're doing your normal say, you share the gospel. As you go, make disciples. Where is the disciple? Where is the growth in our churches? We're just happy sometimes that uh, we have baptized two last month. When you have a congregation of four or five hundred and they baptize two in a whole month, that's almost a dead church. This baptism should be full of water every week. And the Bible said, and they added to the church those who believe like that. That's how the church was in Acts. That's how the church grew. Are you really concerned about the lost? Are you concerned about the great command of our Lord Jesus Christ? It was not a suggestion. It's a command. And if unless we Christians fulfill the great commission, the church will never grow. You will not even grow spiritually because you don't even bother about reading and studying the word of God to be more equipped to reach out to your neighbor and to the lost one. Islam is growing in America, like it or not. Because you don't know anything about it, they take advantage of our ignorance of their book and their teaching and their growing. And they tell us that Islam means peace. The word Islam, actually here, Balaxi uh, 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 Islamic Center, last year I spoke in a radio Christian radio station down there in Gulfport, and they sent them this letter. I have it. And the man said in this article that the word Islam comes from another word which means peace. But he never tell us what is the other word. Well, Arabic is different than English. If I ask you sometimes, what does this word mean? Oh, Brother Usama, let's look in the dictionary. Oh, this English word comes from the Latin, which means this, and you tell me what the word really means. In Arabic, that's the mother language for us, and the Quran and everything about Islam is Arabic, as they claim. We're going to talk about it a little bit later, so but find out it's not true. And then the word Islam in Arabic means surrender. The word Islam means submission. It does not mean anything except surrender or submission. What is salam? Is peace. Hebrew, shalom. Salam and Islam are two separate words. Maybe for us Americans, it, 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 they sound the same. Islam, salam, they're very close. So maybe they both mean peace. No, they don't. Does the word faithful is the same word unfaithful? For Arabic speaking, they're very close. I can imagine see some Egyptian guy traveling in America with his wife, and he's so proud about how faithful he is to his wife. And he tells people, I am so unfaithful to my wife, she loved me. But that would be a full statement. It is exactly for somebody to tell me that Islam means peace is a full statement. Islam means surrender. Islam means submission. To what? That's what we're going to find out a little bit. Watch this video with us, please. I pray to Allah that he will make the enemies fall into their own trap and he will destroy the Jews and their helpers from among the Christians and the communists. What is your path? Jihad. What is your greatest desire? 
death for the sake of Allah. Each of us lives his days and nights, hoping more than anything to be killed for the sake of Allah. We, the Imams and the mosque preachers, we have begun to consider explosive belts. We've begun considering any means of destroying the American. Throats must be slit and skulls must be shattered. This is the path to victory, to shahada, and to sacrifice. But we have a duty to hate them, as is written in the Quran and the Sunnah. We have the duty to hate them, as it is written in the Quran and the Sunnah. Skull must be crushed, throat must be slaughtered. We, as Muslim, the man said, must have. I mean, we be ready even to put the bomb, explosive bomb, around our chest to kill the Jew and the Christian. That's a, a very loving, peaceful picture, is it? But they don't say it there because that's how they feel, because it is written. An American have not have time to read what is written. As a matter of fact, we're voting for people who believe in what is written in this book. And they swear to office on the same book, the Quran. And American people clap hands in Minnesota when Keith Ellison run as a congressman, and he swear on the Quran, which is really a very violent book. And this book teach what? Hate. But that's just their opinion. Maybe these people, these imams, these Muslim leaders from the Middle East uh, misunderstand the Quran. Maybe they don't know exactly really what the Quran meant when it said what it said. So we hear this different uh, video here, different opinion. This is a Muslim imam who grew up here in America and uh, working in America, have a big mosque in America, and he said, all religion teach love. That's what he teach. Listen to him. All religions call for love. No religion calls for hate, Edie. No religion call for hate. All religion teach love. See, the Muslim in the Middle East, they said we must kill them because it is written. We must hate him because it is written in the book. But here's this wonderful imam in America tell you all religion teach love. No religion teach hate. Okay, let's keep going. All religions call for love. No religion calls for hate, Edie. Then what explains that? What explains this is politics. You don't see any American cartoons saying no, kill but, the Muslims. But these are not, not a result of, of the Islamic impulse, it is, an, it, is, it is a result of a political impulse. Mm -hmm. Are those people taking the Quran and taking it out of context? Is this question or is this an answer for the question? It's a sad thing, the people who interview this imam don't know how to ask a question. They give him the answer. Is this people taking the Quran out of context? Oh yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for answering the question for me. Yes, there's a difference between what we say in, in, in this country on that, you know, we should differentiate between the sin, hate the sin, but not the sinner. Um, the Quran teaches the same principle. The Quran teaches the same principle. Hate sin, love sinners. I would love to see one verse in this book teach that. Not even one statement. All over the Quran, God hates sinners. You never see one verse in the Quran, God loves sinners, or Muslims should love sinners. You hate sinners, and you kill sinners. Then how do we get these terrorist organizations that come out and make these statements and use the Quran to justify themselves and their actions? There is something in the human psychology which, which believes in the superiority of its own individual faith and wants to impose it on everybody else. There are those who are Christians who are like this. There are those who are Muslims who are like this. Those who are Christian like this. You know, I've been, uh, I spoke on your TV here uh, Sunday night with David Elliott, and he asked me this question. What do you do of the Christian who go and do a bomb, big bomb in some abortion clinic? Let me say it again. Christianity is not what some Christians do. It is what the New Testament of our Lord Jesus Christ teach. Do you see in the Bible anywhere blow some abortion clinic? No. No. 
Muslim who practice this book, they are the true Muslim. Islam is not what I'm telling you here tonight. Islam is what this book teaches. It is the, teaches of, the teaching of the Quran. That's what Islam is about. Now, somebody is lying. Literally, this Muslim imam from Middle East are lying, or the Muslim imam in the United States are lying. They cannot be both telling the truth. The, the, the guy on the left teach hate. We must kill all the Christian. We must get rid of all the Jew. And the guy on the right, all religions teach love. They cannot be both tell the truth. One of them is lying. Therefore, I will take you to the Quran. I will take you to the Hadith. Let's read what the Quran teaches, and let's learn from the Hadith what Muhammad taught. If we read their books, we know the real picture, and we find out who is lying. Listen now to this verse in the Quran. The Quran says, War is decreed to you, and it is hated by you. And perhaps you may hate something, and it is good for you. And perhaps you love something, and it is evil for you. And Allah knows, and you do not know. Here is God speaking to the Muslim, chapter 2, verse 2, 16. Fighting is decreed for the Muslim. And not only the Quran said it is written for you, it is prescribed to you to go and fight. He knows. Muslims do, do not love to go and kill some other people. Perhaps you may hate something which is good for you, and perhaps you may love something which is not good for you. God knows, the God of Muhammad, that killing people is not fun. And people hate to do that. But that's the best for you if you just knew. This is what the Quran teach. What about Muhammad? You know, we're going to talk about this in depth tomorrow. Most of you in America, Muhammad, the prophet of peace. Muhammad, the prophet of love. Muhammad never touched, never hurt a fly. He never did anything bad. What did Muhammad's message was? Do you want to hear it from his own word? Here it is. Let's listen. What did Muhammad taught? Our prophet, the messenger of our Lord, ordered us to fight you till you worship Allah alone or pay us the jizya tribute tax in submission. Our prophet has informed us that our Lord says, Whoever among us is killed as a martyr shall go to paradise to lead such a luxurious life as he has never seen. And whoever survives shall become your master. That's what prophet taught the Muslim. And that's a true hadith. It's come in Bukhari, hadith number 53 and 6386. That's the hadith. All Muslim in the world, except American, believe in this hadith. Muhammad tells them to go and fight. And if they were lost, if they got killed in the war, guess what? They get to paradise and get the 72 virgin or up to 700 virgin. And if they won, they become your master and you became the slave. That was Muhammad's message in the hadith. Listen to this one. How about this one? I have been commanded to fight against people till they testify to the fact that there is no God but Allah and believe in me that I am the messenger and in all that I have brought. Muhammad has been commanded. He come to fight people until people become Muslim. That's what his message is about. This is his own words. I did not say Muhammad said it. Nobody asked me for apology tomorrow because I'm not going to apologize for what Muhammad said. You don't like what he said, go ask him to apologize to you. How about Tiberi? Let's see what Tiberi said about Muhammad. Arabs are the most noble people in lineage, the most prominent, and the best in deeds. We were the first to respond to the call of the Prophet. We are Allah's helpers and the viziers of his messenger. We fight people until they believe in Allah. He who believes in Allah and his messenger has protected his life and possessions from us. As for one who disbelieves, we will fight him forever in the cause of Allah. Killing him is a small matter to us. Killing you is a small matter for the Muslim. No big deal. How about last one here from Sahih Muslim? And by the way, all the verses I use is from the Quran, and all the hadiths I use is from accepted hadiths. Not weak, not Jewish, not the disabled one. It's all Muslim believing in whole world, but not Muslim American. Command for fighting against people so long as they do not profess that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger. When the messenger breathed his last and Bakr was appointed caliph, many Arabs chose to become apostates. Abu Bakr said, I will definitely fight against anyone who stops paying the zakat tax, for it is an obligation. 
I will fight against them even to secure the cord used for hobbling the feet of a camel, which they used to pay if they withhold it now. So, Allah had justified <clears throat> fighting against those who refused to pay zakat. So it did not stop by Muhammad's death. After Muhammad died, many of the Arab left Islam. Can you imagine that you live under this dictator who are like Saddam Hussein and force people to believe in him? And if you don't, if you leave, you, he'll kill you. Now Muhammad died, so Muslim people start leaving Islam. Well, guess what? Abu Bakr Siddiq, that's the first Khalifa, first leader for the Muslim. He forced the same rules Muhammad forced in the Muslim people, and he commanded them to stay in Islam, paying the zakat, and all the things go back to the normal way of life. And that's how Islam spread all over the world. You remember this picture? See, some of the American people don't believe this happened. They literally don't think it happened. And some now, I, I, I've been hearing lately, that some believe that Bush did that. September 11 was a very tough, smart move from Bush. This picture take place in Palestine. This one take place in Russia. The school, if you remember it. This one is in Indonesia. And this one in Madrid, Spain. This picture in Germany is a nightclub. And this one is in London. And believe me, if you go on this website, you'll find for yourself 10,000 pictures of Muslim attack around the world just recently, the last few years, 10, 20 years, something like that. What is this picture? A picture speaks for a thousand words. This is the fruit falling of the tree of Islam. Do you know that if you put these people who commit this barbarian act from different parts of the world, if you put them together in a room, they cannot even talk to each other. The guy in Indonesia don't speak Russian, don't speak English, don't speak Arabic. The guy in, in England don't speak Russian, don't speak Indonesian, don't speak German. The guy in German does not, they don't even speak the same language, but they believe in one book, the book of the Quran, and they literally practice what this book teach. Listen, a little bit more of the verses of the Quran. O oh, you who have believed, enter completely into Islam and do not follow the steps of Satan. Surely he is an obvious enemy to you. See, that's a wonderful, peaceful verse. I didn't see anything wrong with it. It's an invitation for people to enter into Islam. So don't you dare tell me that Islam is a hateful religion. It's a loving, peaceful religion. You see, it's an invitation. Oh, let me share with you another verse. How about this one? No compulsion in religion. Indeed, the right way is made distinct from the error. Man, this is like John 3.16 for the Muslim. As, as, as far as I travel, as, as far as I spoke to Muslim people, they said, well, Islam is a loving, peaceful religion. The Quran says no compulsion in religion. Well, the verse, first of all, does not teach love or peace at all. It says no compassion religion. It did not say love somebody or be peaceful with somebody. It just said no compassion religion. But let's, one more verse. Listen to this one. It is not your responsibility for their guidance, but Allah guides whom he wills. Man, it was not even Muhammad's job to make anybody believe in Islam or believe in him. It is God's job. You see, wonderful verses like this I can share with you tonight to tell you that Islam is not as you think it is. Islam is a loving, peaceful religion. No, 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 no. Time out. Time out. Let me explain to you something very important. This is a map where Muhammad was born and how his life began. It starts here in Mecca. And in Mecca, at the age of 40 years old, he claimed to be a prophet. And for a long 13 years, from 40 to 53, he taught wonderful things like you just have heard. No compassion religion. Please, if you feel like to believe in my religion, come on in. And it's not really my job to make you Muslim or not. And how many people believe in him? Two dozen. That's in long 13 years. How old is Muhammad by this time? He's 53 years old man. He's about to die with old age. People in his days don't live 80 or 100, they live 60. Wow, it did not work. And then he lost his uncle, he died. And then he lost his wife, she died. And there were two influential people in his life. They protect him from being killed. So he gave up. And he immigrated 
from Mecca to Medina, 210 miles north of Mecca. And there, here we come, the new Islam, the new verses of Allah. And very important doctrine in Islam, you need to know, it's called Nasikh wa Mansukh. We're going to work right now. Maybe we're making a new presentation for this topic alone. Nasikh wa Mansukh. God said something here early in Mecca, but then God changed his mind. So he gave something completely different in Medina. So all the verses has been given in Mecca in the first 13 years of Muhammad's life is wiped out, deleted, erased, with new verses has been given by Allah through angel Gabriel to Muhammad in Medina. Therefore, in the Quran, there is no such a thing as contradiction. It is the new verses. Oh, oh that's when God changed his mind. Oh, oh that's the new verses written in Medina. Oh, this is the verse which deleted the early verses which said whatever it said. Listen carefully to the new teachings of Muhammad, which erased no compulsion in religion. Which erased, it is not your job, Muhammad, to set them in the right path. Which erased, enter into Islam if you feel like. Listen to the new verses of the Quran, which we call it Medini verses. Engage in war with them. Allah will torment them by your hands and put them to shame and give you victory over them and heal the chest of a believing people. What was the command to, from God to Muhammad? To fight them. By the way, chapter 9 in the Quran is the last chapter has been revealed to Muhammad from his angel. Last chapter. Every chapter in the Quran begins with the statement, In the name of God, the compassion and the merciful. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Except chapter 9. It is the only chapter that does not begin with the opening statement in the name of God, the compassion and the merciful. As a matter of fact, it begins with the statement, innocent, bara'a. God is innocent from the people whom Muhammad is going to kill. Last chapter of the Quran. If you don't have time to read the Quran, just read chapter 9. Add to it chapter 8 and chapter 47. Yeah, this three chapter will give you a good picture of the loving, peaceful Islam. O oh, you who have believed, what is the matter with you? When it is said to you, march forth performing jihad for the sake of Allah, you cling heavily to the earth. Are you satisfied with the life of this world rather than the hereafter? So what is the enjoyment of the life of this world but a little compared to the life of the hereafter? What is wrong with you Muslim people? Why you are not performing jihad? Why you are not killing the Christians and the Jew? Why you are not fulfilling your duty are you afraid you're gonna die big deal the enjoyment of this life is nothing comparing to the hereafter comparing to the paradise okay how about this verse oh you prophet provoke the believers to engage in war if there will be 20 patient ones of you they will have victory over 200 muhammad provokes the believers to fight This is a command from God to Muhammad. From now on, Muhammad, you encourage, challenge the people to go and kill. You know, I find this verse exists, the word, I'm sorry, the word jihad, I'm sorry, uh, provoke, harrad, harrad in Arabic. I find it exists one time in my New Testament, the book of Hebrew. Let's compare how the Holy Spirit used the word provoke in the book of Hebrew to how the Satan spirit use the word provoke in the book of the Quran. Listen to the difference. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. The Bible said, and let us provoke one another into love and to good work. While the Bible is command us to love one another and to do good work, the Quran teaches Muhammad provokes a Muslim to fight. What a great difference. So, when the forbidden months are past, so kill the polytheists wherever you find them, and take them as captives, and besiege them, and lay wait for them with every kind of ambush. So, if they repent, and perform the prayer, and give the legal alms, so leave their way free. Surely, Allah is forgiving merciful. What is the forbidden months? This is the four months era before Islam are in agreement among each other that they're not going to fight in it. They're going to be a peaceful four months, no war, no killing, and most Arab respected this four months. So when Muhammad came, he came up with this agreement on that. And he says, after this four months is passed, now 
Kill the idolater wherever you find them. You know, there's a problem for Muslim scholars. They will tell you, yes, there is verses in the Quran teach hate. Yes, there's verses in the Quran teach killing. But this is not for the fun of going and killing people. This is a verse because for self-defense. If you are in your own home, minding your own business, and somebody comes to attack you, <clears throat> or attack your wife or your children, will you stand there and watch them? Of course not. You're going to do everything and anything to protect your family. You, you do everything and anything to protect your country. Therefore, all the verses in the Quran which teach hate or teach kill, it's not really for the fun of, you know, uh, going and killing. It's for self-defense. Well, let's, let's look at this verse one more time here. So when the forbidden months are past, so kill the, uh, the idolater wherever you find them. Does wherever you find them mean self-defense or you go search for them? Okay. And take them as captive or slave. Besiege them. Lay a weight for them with every kind of ambush. Is this self-protection? Is this self-defense? Watch the key point here. But if they repent, if they converted to Islam, if they accept you, Muhammad, to be a prophet and believe in the religion of Islam, then let them go free. This verse really gave us three options for people. To be killed, to be slave, to be Muslim. That's how Islam spread around the world. Here's a good verse in the Quran, chapter 47, that's called the book of Muhammad. Every chapter in the Quran has a title or a name. You can really take the word, the book of Muhammad, out and replace it by the book of killing. Listen to what the verse says. So, when you meet those who became infidels, so strike the necks until you have made a great slaughter among them. Chop off the head of the infidel. You know, so amazing, the last few... Uh, videos have been made or pictures have been put on, on TV uh, four or five years ago about some men being beheaded, you know, when they cut their head off and they put the picture online or the video online. And then Muslim imams in America stand with sorrow in their heart, tears almost in their eyes and say, we Muslim condemn this act. Islam does not teach that. We are loving, peaceful people. Does these people know what the Quran says? The Quran says, chop off their heads. This imam is graduated of Azhar school in Cairo, and he memorized the Quran, and he memorized chapter 47, and I know for sure he knows what this verse says. Chop off the head. That's the only way Muslims have been, for the last 1400 years, practice execution. That's how they kill the infidel. That's how they kill 4 million of my people when they came to Egypt 1400 years ago. Now, the question is, who are the infidel? See, Muslim in America could also defend this verse and tell you, well, these are the people who don't believe in God. We are commanded in the Quran, and they will quote you one or two verses in the Mecca verses, the early verses, where they say, Christian are good people. Jew are good people. And these people, and Sabayin is good people. And so we don't kill Christian. We don't kill Jews. They are not infidel. I'm sorry. Christian, all Christian, according to the coming two verses, are infidel. Let me share with you what the Quran teaches, who are the infidel. In chapter 5, verse 72, the Quran says, Infidels indeed are those who said, Surely Allah is the Christ, son of Mary. And Christ said, O children of Israel, serve Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Surely whoever partners with Allah, so indeed Allah forbids him the garden. And his abode is the fire, and the unjust will have no helpers. Do you, are you people here in First Baptist Biloxi believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God Almighty who came to flesh? I can hear you. Yes. You are an infidel. Let's see this next verse. Infidels indeed are those who said, Surely Allah is the third of three, and there is no God except one God. And if they do not refrain from what they are saying, a painful torment will touch those who became infidels among them. Are you people here tonight believe that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are true one God? Do you believe in Trinity? You are an infidel. 
And the Quran command what? To chop off the head of the infidel. That's why Nick lost his head. That's why Armstrong lost his head. That's why Kim Sono lost his head. Well, that's amazing. I really don't care about how many people they killed. But it bothers me so much when we put too much emphasis on so many people has been killed. But when we get to a Christian, we close our media off. What do we know about Kim Sonoff? Because the media did not tell us anything. We know everything about Armstrong. What company he worked for, how many years he worked for, he was a truck driver, how much he was making. We know everything about his family. But when it came to Kim Sonoff, who knows who is Kim Sonoff? Kim's parents had urged the Seoul government to do everything to save their son, who had a degree in theology as well as Arabic, and had hoped to be a Christian missionary in the Arab world. The president of the company he worked for was a devout Christian, and the company donated 10% of its profits for missionary work. Kim Sonoff was a missionary from South Korea who studied hard and he got his master's degree in theology. And then he studied a little bit more harder and he studied Arabic language. And then he traveled all the way from South Korea to work in Iraq, undercover job, it's called tent job, whatever, to be a missionary in Iraq. And when Musab Zarqawi cut his head, and I saw the video, Kim Sonal, his head was tied behind his back, and his feet was tied too. And, and most of Zarqawi watched him with his right foot like this, so he fell on his side, and he cut his, hand, his head by his hand, and he started cutting his head. And he said, this man was a missionary in our land. His blood is lawful to be shed because he was a priest. We even saw him Baptist, he don't know anything about this guy. Christian America don't know anything about this guy. It could be me. And nobody will know who is Usama Daknok. Three times I was supposed to go to Iraq. One time I was in New Orleans school was Michael Edens. He's, still te he's teaching right now there. Right now, Brother Mike is teaching there. And the Lord closed the door. And two times was independent Baptist. We stopped one time in Cairo and we stopped one time in Kuwait and I was never able to go to Iraq. And I said, maybe the Lord have another plan for me to do some ministry later. And here I am doing this ministry now. But why our media hide anything about Kim Sun Oh? Because he's just a missionary. It's not that important. Are you a missionary to your neighbor? You see, Kim Sun Oh was able to study hard and work hard, get his master's degree, learn Arabic, know the Bible right and left, and he went all the way to Iraq to serve. I'm not asking you to go to Iraq or South Korea or anywhere. Just visit your neighbor. How about love your neighbor across the street? You didn't have to learn another language, by the way. They speak English. Maybe you need to memorize a few verses in the Bible. You don't have to have a master's degree like Kim Sonal. Just know your facts. Where in the Bible what you believe. So you can go share with your neighbor. You know the Bible says, and I believe in that. And that's how we can fulfill the Great Commission. And that's how we can more, we'll be more effective for Jesus. A few more verses, loving verses in the Quran. This one says, March forth lightly or heavily and perform jihad with your money and your lives for the sake of Allah. This is best for you if you were knowing. The only true English translation is mine. Where you see in it, the Quran says, perform jihad, not struggle or strive. The word in Arabic, in full khifaf al wasiqalan, wa jahidu. The word jahidu is perform jihad. Holy war. Fight for the sake of Allah. How you do that? With your wealth and with your lives. Somebody have to pay Muhammad Atta money to come to live in America to learn how to fly an aeroplane. And then Muhammad Atta will take the aeroplane to your building. O oh, you prophet, perform jihad against the infidels and the hypocrites, and be harsh with them, and their abode will be hell, and evil is the destination. Take the word infidel out and put Christian. So, O oh, you prophet, perform jihad against the Christian and the hypocrite. Be harsh with them. That's the verses of the Quran, whom Keith Allison swear on to be the congressman of Minnesota. And American people 
clap hand for him. Hooray, hooray! We got ourselves a good Nation of Islam congressman. Engage in war with those who do not believe in Allah and in the last day. And do not forbid what Allah and his messenger forbid. And do not believe in the religion of the truth among those who have been given the book until they pay the tribute out of hand and they are subdued. That's what the Quran teach. And not only Muhammad commanding the Muslim to fight against the Jew and the Christian, he even bragging about it in the Quran that he kills him and he terrorizes him. And he brought down the people of the book who backed them from their strong places and cast terror into their hearts. A group of them you are killing and a group of them you are taking captive. And he made you to inherit their land and their homes and their money and a land which you had never set foot on. And Allah was mighty over all things. Notice here, cast terror into their hearts. The terrorizing of the world, the terrorizing of the Jew and Christian did not begin in September 11. It was always there for the last 1400 years. They took our homes, they took our land, they took our money. And here is the evidence. It's not because I said so, because Muhammad claims so in his own book, the Quran. If we just knew what is written in the Quran. Many people have serious questions about the religion of Islam. Who are Muslims and what do they believe? Liberal Muslim scholars and clerics spin the news and continually promote Islam as the religion of peace and that Jews, Christians and Muslims worship the same God. But is this true? Where can we turn for the answers? To truly know what a faith teaches, you have to go to the book. And for the last 1400 years, that book for Muslims is the Quran. This collection of the sayings and teachings that Muhammad claimed to have received from Allah is the sacred text for over a billion Muslims worldwide. But the Quran was written in Arabic, so how can we in the West learn what it really says? Muslim apologists have produced several English translations over the years, but these have been carefully edited to hide many of the blatant errors, immoral teachings, and violent commands throughout the book. In the beginning of our ministry, we decided to tell the truth about Islam. Uh, therefore, we decided to buy the English translation of the Quran to use the verses which is written there. Sadly, I could not find one Quran to present the truth as it is written in the Arabic language. They sugarcoat it. They water it down. That's why we decided to go ahead and translate the Quran from Arabic to English, a true English translation. The Straight Way of Grace Ministry, in cooperation with Arab and English scholars from around the world, has produced the most accurate English translation of Islam's holy book ever printed. Read for yourself exactly what Muhammad taught his followers about war and violence, about sex and marriage, about the treatment of infidels, and more importantly, what he said about Jesus. Islam is not what I share with you or what some moderate Muslim tell you. Islam is the verses of the Quran. We must separate Muslim from Islam. There are so many wonderful Muslim people out there, but they are not true Muslim because simply they don't practice what the Quran teaches. So many American people say they accept Islam. They do not have any problem for Muslim to practice Islam in America, but same people rejecting Sharia, Islamic law. Not knowing that Sharia, Islamic law, is a practice of the verse of the Quran. This translation has been produced with the modern student in mind, with several key features including study notes for the reader, detailed notes concerning errors and contradictions in the text, careful comparisons between the Quran and biblical accounts, and references to the original sources that Muhammad borrowed from. Special sections discuss key topics such as a compilation of non-Arabic words and idioms found in the Quran, an easy to follow chart outlining the fulfilled prophecies concerning Jesus in the Old Testament and a challenging gospel invitation to introduce the reader to the scientific, historical, and biblical reasons for accepting the true Jesus as the only Lord and Savior. In the book of Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6, the Bible said, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It is time for us to read the Quran. It's time for us to find the truth for ourselves. For ordering and more information, please visit thestraightway.org. Read the Quran for yourself and understand the roots of this dangerous faith. Individual copy and case pricing are available. Let's change a little bit the uh, uh, topic here. God and Allah. You know what's amazing? Until, until today, as I'm translating the Quran, I'm working on it, I'm learning new things. 
Do you know that just this week I found out that the word Allah is not an Arabic word? And, and here in America, we have so many people spoke against the word Allah as it is a bad thing. And, and, and I have argument with some of my wonderful best friends, some of even my professors on, on, in New Orleans, where I said, no, I'm sorry, the word Allah is God. There's nothing wrong with the word Allah. I believe in Allah. My Bible in Arabic said, in the beginning, Allah created the heaven and earth. And my Bible said in John 3, 16, for Allah so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There's nothing wrong with, wrong with the word Allah. And then I asked this Spanish friend, I said, what is God in Spanish? He said, Deus. I said, oh, now can we go to the Spanish people, Deus is no God? You cannot tell the Arab, Allah is no God, because that's the word they use for God, is Allah. If you go to Hebrew, it's Elohim. And some other language would sound different. The question we need to ask is, does not does God equal Allah? The question we need to ask is, the Allah of Islam is the same Allah of Christianity. Do Muslims worship the same God we worship? No, they don't. It's not because I said so, because the Quran said so, because their belief is completely to a different God. I totally, 100% believe that Muslims worship Satan under the name God. In his book, uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmed Chalabi, he wrote a book by the title of Islam, and his book talked about the names of God. Now, in, in, the names of God come directly from the Quran. And, and you, when you read the Quran, you did not find this chapter say, uh, the names of God, uh, 1, 2, 99. Muslims believe up to six months ago that there are 99 names for God in this book. And as you read the verses of the Quran in different places, you're going to see God is blah, 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 and that's one of the names of God. Uh, six months ago, they vote, they got like a council meeting, and they decided to take 23, 23 names out. So now Muslims do no longer believe in 99 names, but believe in 99 minus 23. Now, listen to what Dr. Ahmed Chalabi says about the names of God. The names of God, as Muslims see it, come directly from the Quran. Therefore, Muslims cannot call him God of love, simply because God did not describe himself as the God of love. God did not describe himself in the Quran as a God of love. Therefore, Muslims do not believe in God to be a loving God. Well, I'm sorry. My Bible said God is a loving God. That you don't worship my God. They worship another God. And amazingly, I found a verse in the Quran said God love. And if the Quran said God loves, that means God is a loving God. But whom God love? Listen carefully to this verse. Surely Allah loves those who engage in war in ranks for his sake, as if they were a solid wall. God love Osama bin Laden. God love Musab Zarqawi. God love Ayman Zawahiri. God loves this, those people who fight for his sake. What a loving God. Let's compare this to my Bible. And the Bible says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. Are you born of God? Do you really love your neighbor? Do you love your family member, the lost one? See, if you are not a Christian, you can't love them because some of them are terrible. But if you are a Christian, you are commanded by God to love them. Those whom love God, who are born of God, must love everyone around us. We must love the Muslim people simply because they are our enemy. They hate us. Their book teach to kill us. And what Christ commands? Love your enemy. So many people hear me speaking and they come with a conclusion. Oh, brother Yusama, don't want us to hate the Muslim people. That's the opposite of what I'm trying to teach. I want every American Christian to love the Muslim to the point to must, you must share the gospel with them and you must lead them out of the darkness of Islam. And if you don't love your neighbor, the Muslim one or non-Muslim one, you are not a Christian at all. No, because I said so, it's because John 4, 1 John 4, 7, 8 said so. If you don't like it, when you go home, get a highlight, a marker, black one, and highlight these verses out of your Bible. And by the way, you're going to be finding yourself highlight the whole Bible. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just, just highlight the whole Bible. How friendly are the Muslims? You see, in America, we see him here, and it's so amazing. Our media is, is I sometimes when I sit and watch CNN and CBS and all these wonderful liberal TV channels and radio stations, whatever, you feel like it's all bought by Muslims. The Muslims bought our country. I mean, like last year, they have this September 11 day, 9-11. And they are zooming with camera, very, very low, very close zooming on this couple. There were hundreds of people in New York to remember this wonderful uh, attack on our country by the wonderful Muslim people. And they do not zoom on anybody except on the Muslim couple. And she was completely covered, and her husband had a beard, a Muslim Sunni. By the way, when a Muslim is, woman is covered and a man grow up a beard, that's 100% they are jihadists. But we don't know it. We think that's they're Muslim. They're practicing their Quran to the point. You know, when you see some Muslim don't care, showing half of their body as they walk in the street naked, they don't care what the Quran teaches. But if they cover, grow up the beard, sincere face, no smile, they're real Muslim. I consider them born again Muslim, jihadists. And they zoom the camera on them, and she holds the flag, American flag in her hand, and tears coming from her eyes. How wonderful Muslim people. They are very friendly. I'm sorry. I want to look at another picture. I want to look at what the Quran teaches. Can Muslim people in America or any part of the world be real Muslim, true Muslim, and be a friend to the Jew and the Christian? Can they? That's a question. Can a man or a woman be a true Muslim and be friend with you according to the teaching of the Quran? O you who have believed, do not take the Jews and the Christians as friends. They are friends to one another. And whoever among you takes them as friends, so surely he is of them. Surely Allah does not guide the unjust people. Don't. Do not, don't, don't do it. The Quran commands Muslims not to be friends with the Jew and Christian. That's what the Quran teaches. That's why they hate us. Maybe our president would tell us that Saudi is our, our friend, but that's a lie. That's a 100% lie. And I'm not saying this because I don't like Bush. I love Bush. I vote for him twice. And if he run for any other office, I will vote for him again. But when he lie, he's dead wrong. Saudi are not our friend at all. They will never be our friend. Saudi are paying money to kill our soldiers overseas. Saudi are giving money to the Shia and to the Sunni to kill our soldiers overseas. Saudi are taking over the United States. And I wish I had time to share with you. Saudi are putting mosques in every one of your public schools. Saudi are teaching material in our public school, and I'll share with you some tomorrow. If you know what Saudi is putting in our public school right now, you'll be real man. No true Muslim is a friend who is a Jew or Christian. Not because I said so, because the Quran said so. Islam is not what I say, but what this book teaches. Pillar of Islam. First pillar in Islam they teach to our kids in school is shihada. That's when you say in Arabic, not in any other language, you have to see everything in Islam is built on Arabic language. And that's how Islam was able to spread all over the world this last few years. Because you don't know what you're saying, you just say whatever they tell you to say, and you believe whatever they tell you, you're a Muslim. If you know exactly what the book teach, and what they say exactly mean, and if you think about it for a few minutes, you will never believe in it. But it's all built on ignorance. First one is, you must say in Arabic, Ashhadu anna la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness there is no God but Allah, and I bear witness that Muhammad is his prophet. Is this a true witness? Not according to the Quran. The Quran says, only a true witness is the one who see by his eyes, hear by his ear, smell by his nose, touch by his hand, and taste by his tongue. You have to use your five senses, otherwise you're a false witness. Do you know any Muslim in the world today seen Muhammad, heard Muhammad, touched Muhammad? How can you bear witness of something you never saw? You never heard? Well, Muslim can say the same thing about us. It's, well, you Christian 
bear witness that Jesus is the Son of God. I'm sorry, I never bear witness that Jesus is the Son of God. Me, personally, I never did. I believe Jesus is God Almighty and He's the Son of God down on the cross and rose from the dead for my salvation. I'm justified because of what Jesus did on the cross. I believe, but I'm not a witness. Wait, wait a minute, time out again here. The Bible said, you are my witnesses. Yes! <laughs> the Bible, Jesus talking to his disciples, and they were true witnesses. They said, we have touched him, we have heard him, we have ate with him, we have talked to him. Jesus appeared to him over five, over than 500 people for this 40 years, 40 days of appear before he has ascended to, to heaven after his resurrection. 40 days. 500 was alive at the time of the writing, and all these people were true witness. But we are blessed. We even blessed more than Thomas, Jesus said. Oh, Thomas. Poor Thomas. You believe in me because you have seen me, Thomas? Because you have touched me, Thomas? Blessed are those who believe without seeing. We are more blessed than Thomas. But according, here's the first pillar. I'm talking about, this is the pillar where Islam structures stand on. First pillar is a lie. How can you bear witness that Muhammad is a prophet where you never heard or seen or touched? What if he was a false? What does the Quran teach about Muhammad? Can Muhammad be a prophet? Listen to the teaching of the Quran. And indeed, we gave the book and the wisdom and the prophethood to the children of Israel, and we provided them with the good things, and we favored them above the world. God favors the Jew above the world, the children of Israel by the prophethood and the book. All the prophets are Jew, and the Jew are the descendant of Israel are the prophet. Muhammad is not a descendant of Israel. This is one verse in the Quran. How about this next verse, chapter 29? And we granted him Isaac and Jacob, and we assigned the prophethood and the book to his descendants. First him in this verse is Abraham. His descendant is going back to Jacob. Well, some Muslims say, wait a minute, you're taking this verse out. You, you misinterpret this verse. Why is that? Because his is going back to Abraham. Why does he want his, which is his descendant, in the bottom red word here, are not Jacob, but Abraham, because they want to put Ishmael into it. So if his descendant, that's Ishmael, Abraham descendant, that make Ishmael is one of the descendants of Abraham, and Muhammad came from Ishmael because all the Arabs came from Ishmael. That make Muhammad is a prophet. Well, I have some bad news for the Muslim people. When you read the Bible, it said, and we, God said, in, in the seed of Abraham, we bless the whole world. He's not talking about seeds. He's talking about one seed, singular, Jesus Christ. And when you read chapter 37 in the Quran and you read the, so the story of the sacrificed son, you will never find Ishmael exists. See, all Muslim people believe that in the seed of, Ishmael, of Abraham, which is Ishmael, which is a lie, is the whole world will be blessed through Muhammad. No! Read the story in the Quran. And the Quran never mentioned who is the sacrificed son's name is. He said, his son, his son, his son. But so amazingly, there's enough facts there to tell me that this son is not Ishmael, but Isaac. In the end of the conversation, in the bottom there, the Quran says, and we made his son Isaac a great prophet. So the sacrificed son was not Ishmael, but Isaac. That's one thing. The second thing, the Hadith supports this very well. So the Hadith said, Abraham took Hagar and her son Ishmael and sent them to Mecca, which never happened because the Bible said they went to Egypt. They get lost in Beersheba, and then they went to Egypt, and then he got a, a wife, Egyptian wife, and then they live uh, uh, in the northeast of Israel in front of his brother Isaac. So, but the Hadith said that Abraham took Hagar and Ishmael to Mecca when he was a baby, still breastfeed from his mama, two years or young. Let's read the story again in the Quran about the sacrificed son. As he was old to walk with his daddy, and he was talk to his daddy, and his daddy said, Oh, my son, I see in my dream I'm sacrificing you. And he said, oh, It's okay, daddy. I'll be obedient to you, daddy. Is this a two years or young baby? No. Therefore, it must be Isaac. 
And then let's get to the next, a very important fact. Israeli Arab are descendants of Ishmael? I used to believe that until my brother called me from Egypt and he said, Yusama, you are in college now. I said, yes. You are in New Orleans, it's a big school. Yes. They have lots of books, libraries there. Yes. Can you do me a paper on where Arab came from? I said, Philemon. He said, my brother, his name is Philemon. I said, Philemon, he's a pastor in Egypt. I said, brother Philemon, it's very simple. They came from Ishmael. He said, you're wrong. Just do a paper, do a research. I said, I don't even know which doctor I can convince them to allow me to do a, a research unless I do it on my own. Well, I went to Dr. Uh, uh, Taylor, Ken Taylor, and he said, do it. I said, well, thank you, Dr. Taylor. I really appreciate it. He's a nice, decent doctor. I like him. I love Brother Smith, too. He's a wonderful teacher we have in school. And then he said, do it. So I did it. Well, guess what? I went to the library, and I picked some of these big books, and I, I'm searching for Keturah. What about Keturah? The Bible in Genesis 25, it said, and after Sarah died, he took, Abraham took another wife by the name Keturah. So I'm searching for Keturah, and the first thing comes in this big book I got out of the library, the first thing is Keturah is the mother of the ancestor of Arab. So, whoa, my brother Philemon was right. And I kept searching, searching, the more I searched, I found, Arab have nothing to do with Ishmael. Ishmael is the father of Ishmaelites, and Arab are the descendants of Keturah and Abraham. And when you read Genesis 25, you see, here are their children, and here are their grandchildren, and they are so hard named to pronounce in English, so American people skip this section. Well, guess what? When I did my search, I didn't skip it. I read every word, every name, and guess what? Three of the grandchildren of Abraham and Keturah are named after three Arab countries. Wow. Can Muhammad be a prophet? No, he's not a prophet. First of all, because he has no prophecy. Second important thing, because he is not the descendant of Jacob, Israel. Second pillar in Islam is prayer. And Muslim people pray five times a day, and they brag about praying five times a day. As a matter of fact, last time I went on YouTube, I was watching this Muslim-American wonderful lady who became a Muslim, and she said, Islam taught me to pray. In Christianity, when I was a Christian, I never prayed. But now I pray five times a day. I said, wow. I did not know that Christianity allowed for less than five, ten, twenty. What does the Bible say about prayer? Pray without? That's like 24-7. But she thinks that in the Bible, there was no thing about prayer. I'm sorry. You're wrong, sister. And then, amazingly, all the Muslims I met, they pray in a language they don't know what they're saying. Five times a day, blah, 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 blah. Amen. Why five? When you read the Quran, will you find a verse in the Quran say, pray five times a day? No. The Quran mentioned three prayers. Morning and late at night, and one in the middle. He didn't even name them right. One early, one late, and one in the middle. Where did they come up with five prayer? The Hadith. Remember, I told you about the Hadith, the collection of Muhammad sayings? Let me share with you a few Hadiths to know how ridiculous is the book of the Hadith. Muslims tell you, you cannot understand the Quran unless you read the Hadith. And when you read the Hadith, there's nothing to understand, really. Let me share with you some of the hadith. <clears throat> Muhammad said in the hadith, if a fly fall into a dish or a cup, there's food or drink in it, okay? Do not throw the food away, but baptize the fly. Make sure all the fly is under the food or the fluid. Real immersion. That's how I know Muhammad was a Baptist. <laughs> shake, shake both wings under the food, and then you throw the fly away, and then you eat or you drink, and nothing will harm you. Why is that? Because Muhammad said, one of the fly wings has a virus. And the other fly wing has a cure for the virus. And if you shake both wings in the food or the liquid, it, nothing will harm you. It will be neutral. I have argued with some Muslim students in America, in some uh, university in Florida, about this, and they will tell me, well, could you tell me how did Muhammad found out about the fly wings, the virus, and the cure 1,400 years ago, unless he was a true prophet? They're using this baloney to prove his prophecy. 
Is it true that fly wings have cure? Look at the fly. Can you see from where you're at? You see how much hair on her legs and her body? Wherever, wherever this fly was standing on before you get to your food, that's what you're going to get in your food. Most, most likely, the two important clean part in her body is the wings, because they move them fast, and all the stuff fly off the wings. Use your imagination. That's how the hadith is written. Whatever Muhammad says is a hadith, and it's true. Is this true? No, it is not. Well, let me share with you one more. For those who would like to lose weight, Muhammad gave us the best diet. I mean, you do this diet, you, I guarantee you, you will lose all the weight you need. Muhammad said, your stomach is really contained. Uh, you need to fill your stomach in three sections. The first section of your stomach you fill with food, just one third. Now, the second part of your stomach you need to fill with water. No diet, Coke and diet, Pepsi, just water, H2O, okay? The third part of your stomach you need to fill with air. If you do this for a good couple, three months, you lose all the weight you need to lose. And how in the world Muhammad knows the fact about the best way to eat 1,400 years ago unless he was a true prophet? And I kind of believe it for a while, and I get sink. How in the world Muhammad's going to put air inside his stomach? <sighs> I could not. Until one time we went to buy bicycle for our son Caleb, and... Uh, in the bicycle side there, there was um, a plastic uh, pump. It's for, for $9 or less than 10 bucks, and they give you five years warranty. All what you need is just to cut the tip of the hose and put it down in your stomach and pump one third air. Does this really work? Can your stomach hold an air? Have you ever seen a baby when they're crying and they're hungry? And then after you feed them, they're still crying again. <laughs> Now the question is, why baby cry after you feed them? Because he got air inside his stomach. And what grandma said, perp the baby softly. They got the air out, and they are now normal. Now they are not crying anymore. And that's how it works. If you drink any drink, any soft drink, and you try to hold the air in your stomach, you can't in your body. You can't. Your stomach does not hold any air at all. Muhammad is a liar. The hadith is not true. Hadith is baloney. Now, we have a one more important hadith where why Muslim people pray five times a day, and this will get into serious things. Now, now, Muslim people believe there are seven heavens. How many heavens do we have in the Bible? No. Three. Here we go. Let me show you. Here we go. Here's earth, and here's the first heaven, the heaven of the atmosphere. Now, our satellite uh, is right, right now. I don't know if it's come down. It is, it's outside. Outside, they're a little bit up higher here, outside the atmosphere. Now, the second heaven, the Bible talks about the heaven of the space. The heaven declares the glory of the hands, the sun and the moon, the star, all this up in the second heaven. The third heaven is what the Bible also calls the heaven of heavens. And in the third heaven, that's where uh, Jesus has ascended to. That's where John has ascended to. And that's where Paul, and Paul did not even know if he was ascended by his flesh or just a spirit. He was an honest guy. Now, Muhammad said that he has been ascended to the seven heaven. Now, where in the world do you get another four from? I don't know. And the hadith is clearly the distance between one heaven and another heaven is 500 years traveling. I'm guessing camel speed. 500 years was a camel equal to less than an hour with our shuttle. So in, uh, in four and a half hour, our people inside the shuttle, they already passed God, the seven heaven. That's a joke. It's supposed to be laughing, but that's okay. <laughs> Not only the Quran believes or teaches there is seven, but the Quran also teaches there are seven earths. A friend of mine, he, li he actually uh, lived here in uh, Gulfport. Uh, he go to another Baptist church, and I told him uh, the other day, I said, why in the world are you wasting all the money to, learn, to search if there is life on Mars or some other place? Why can't you search for the other six earths? I said, six earths. I said, yes, Muhammad said in the Quran, seven earths. He said, Muhammad is a liar. So I don't know who I believe, Muhammad or my friend. But the Bible said one earth, three heaven. Muhammad teach seven of each. So who knows? 
Of course, who knows a liar? I know Muhammad is lying. But anyway, so Muhammad has been ascended to the seven heaven. And let me tell you the story exactly how it happened. Here we go. Muhammad was sleeping on his bed next to his wife Khadija. And then the angel, Angel Gabriel, came and wake him up. He, by the way, Angel Gabriel did not come through the house from the window or the door. He came from the roof. Okay? And then he wake up Muhammad and he opened his chest like a heart surgery. <laughs> And he go inside and he clean his heart from all sin and iniquity and he fill him with wisdom and knowledge and then he said muhammad are you ready up we're gonna go to a quick trip we're gonna go to jerusalem okay why so they can pray in jerusalem so muslim people today have the right to have the mosque in jerusalem that's that's all built together so in a blink of an eye woo, quickly muhammad has been fly all the way from mecca to jerusalem and in jerusalem he pray with all the prophets that's why it's the holy site for the muslim people now if this hadith is not true muslim have no right to have this mosque in jerusalem because it's built on a lie but that's okay now he's in jerusalem and then uh, uh, angel gabriel has provided muhammad with this mule so muhammad is riding on the mule and angel gabriel flying with his wings and they fly all the way to the first heaven and when they get to the first heaven uh, they knock at the door and the angel inside they get say who is there and angel gabriel said it's me angel gabriel and he said anybody who was you he said yes i have prophet muhammad with me please come on in come on in so they enter the first heaven when they get to the first inside the first heaven muhammad saw this tall tall long tall man or we say long or tall very tall guy and this old man every time he look at his right hand he laugh <laughs> and then when he look at his left hand he cry and weep <laughs> so muhammad asked angel gabriel who is this guy what's wrong with him why he's laughing and crying he says this is father adam every time he look at his right hand he sees all those who believe in you and he's happy for them and every time he look at his left hand he sees all those who disbelieve in you and he cry and weep for them oh second mistake first mistake is what there's no save in heaven second mistake is adam was crying inside the heaven and weeping have you ever read the bible what the bible said what they do in heaven no tears in heaven so if, if really really muhammad went to heaven he should not see anybody cry or weep in heaven but guess how tall was adam let me, let me show you how accurate the hadith is can somebody give me a number brother give me a number big number how tall adam was six five that's too short somebody else brother how tall adam seven 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 fifty feet Man, this guy's close. <laughs> 60 yard. Adam is 60 yard tall or long, whatever you want to call it. His foot will be bigger than this church. Now, do you want to continue with this hadith or do you find out enough that's a lie? Well, let's continue anyway. So they went to the second heaven. In the third heaven, they met with Moses. And Moses talked to Adam, uh, to Muhammad, and Muhammad talked to Moses. Four, five, six heaven. And in the sixth heaven, angel Gabriel told Ad, uh, tell, uh, Muhammad, you are on your own, man. I can go with you to meet God. It's the most holy place. Even Gabriel could not meet with God. But Muhammad was able to get to the seventh heaven and talk to God. And God said, Adam, uh, Muhammad, he said, yes, yes, Lord. He said, I want you to go back to earth and tell your people to pray 50 times a day. No problem. My Arab people are strong. They can pray a hundred if you want. He's going down to the earth and he stopped at the third heaven. And guess who was there? Moses. So Moses said, what did God tell you? He said, oh, God asked me to ask the people to pray 50 times a day. Well, 50 times a day? People will kill you, man. You need to go back to God. Tell them that's too much. Okay. God, I, I, I just talked to Moses in third heaven and he told me 50 is too much. 45. All oh, right. Thank you. 45 is too much. God, 40. All oh, right. Literally, he moved from the third heaven to the seventh heaven. And the seventh heaven to the earth, third heaven, 17, 18 times to cut it from 50 to 5. And that's why Muslim people pray five times a day. Now, and then he went all the way back to bed 
next to his wife Khadija, and the bed still warm. So how long does this trip take? A couple hours, maybe three hours, if it's a, a, a warm night. Well, we have a problem. What is the problem? You see, in the Quran, there's two verses contradict each other already. One verse says, the angels come from heaven to earth in a day equal to 1,000 years from what we count on earth. 1,000 years. But there's another verse in the Quran that says that the angels come from heaven to earth in a day equal 50,000 years. 1,000 years, 50,000 years, the difference is 49,000 years. That's the last to swallow, you know. There's something wrong there. But Muslim scholars have an answer for every question. You see, if you're going from earth to the first heaven, which is closer to earth, it's only take a thousand years. But if you're going to the seventh heaven, which is far, far, far away, it would take you 50,000 years. So both numbers are right. Now, how in the world Muhammad were able to get to the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, three, seven, three, seven, three, 18 time back to earth in two hours? Maybe if he was by himself, I can imagine he can do it. But Angel Gabriel was with him. The whole hadith is a lie. And that's how hadith is built in Islam. So many hadiths, I wish I have time to share with you more of the hadiths to show you that it is lie after lie. It's made up stuff, made up talk. Somebody said, have nothing to do except blah, 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 and people believe him and write it down. Here's another hadith, another hadith. But Muslim people pray five times a day. How many times do you pray? When is last time you came back to this building to pray on Wednesday night? Do you remember the last time you pray with the body of believers of Christ in this building, in this congregation? Do you pray in your own on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday five times a day? How about a commitment tonight to really take prayer seriously? Zakat. Muslim people give 20% in Muhammad days from the spoil. Do you know what is spoil? That's when the Muslim attacks the innocent people and through invasion and they kill the men and they take the women and children and camels and all the good stuff and the land. So, so Muhammad used to get 20%. But today, since we don't, we don't have any invasion, they only send 2.5% of their net work, net money they make. So American Muslim here who work hard and making money, they send the money to support jihadists all over the world. Your doctor, the gas station where you bomb your gas, the hotel you stay in, and all the business around America, when we go and buy stuff from them, this money they make, they send 2.5% to overseas. Well, FBI was so smart, they catch 80 mosques, literally 80 mosques, they prove it, who supported terrorism. How about the rest of the mosques? That's where our foolishness fall in. Every mosque in America. There's so much to talk about. Do you know that mosques in America are paid cash when they build them by Wahhabi money? They don't borrow money like we Christians do to go buy a, to build a church. It's already paid off. You go check it out. Show me a mosque, borrow money from a bank. They don't do that. It's already paid cash off. So they don't have any expense. And now all the money they give, they go overseas to help terrorism. Every mosque in America supports terrorism today. The FBI saw they stopped it five years ago because they stopped their account, uh, moving money in account. That's the baloney. I've been sending money to my dad in Egypt for the last 15 years. I don't send much, but I send as much as I can. And I never send him a check. I never use a bank to send money. Do you think a Muslim who are willing to die for Allah, put him bomb around his chest, will be afraid to carry a bag with money in it? What is the money Hezbollah in Lebanon were given to the people, the Muslim of Lebanon, last year after the one month war between Israel and Lebanon? It was USA dollar. And it was not counterfeit. It was real money. How in the world this money went there? Did they hold this money for four years? No. Muslim today in America send USA dollar overseas. But the question is to us here tonight is, what do you do with this dish here? Do we give? Do we worship through giving? Or we just go to Christian Tibber? You know, you go to a, 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 a restaurant and eat, 
and you, the lady, she came two, three times to your table, put your coffee in the cup, and serve you very well, and you get 10 bucks, and you put it in the dish. Or not on the dish, on the table. $10 tip. That's what we do in a church. Baptists are tipping God. We're not offering what we've been asked to. Tie is 10%. Plus, you give offering. We're tipping God. I mean, I, I, my dad came here to America in my first Baptist church in Bass, Florida, and I was so embarrassed to let my dad sit on the front. I put him all the way in the back. Because you know what? There was like a four or five seat empty space. He wanted to sit down. I said, oh, no. The dish is going to go one, two, three, four times, and it comes before my dad, it will be empty. I'd rather to put my dad all the way in the back so in, at least he sees some money in the dish and some envelopes. When the dish buy, go by you, do you really worship God through your tithes? Tithes, if you make $1,000 last week, did you put $100 today in the dish? That's God's money. Through all the Bible, you could not test God. It's a no, no, no. But when it came to money, he said, test me. You know what? Why can't you take the Bible one time seriously right? He said, Lord, I'm going to test you for the next year. I'm going to tie with cheerful heart. I don't want you to write the check like you're writing your death certificate. Don't do it. If you're going to do that, don't even give. But be faithful to God and worship through tie and offering for a whole entire year. And if he does not bless you, don't give again at all. No tip or nothing. Keep all the money for yourself. Do we as a church worship God through our offering? You know how many opportunities of ministry we can do and we're not doing because we don't have money? Muslims know how to give. And we Christians, sadly, tip God. We don't give as we has been commanded in his word. Ramadan. That's when you fast a whole day of the whole month of Ramadan. All day long, the whole month of Ramadan. And then you eat all night long. Do you know that Muslims in Egypt, in the month of Ramadan, they consume food more than the whole three months in any time of the year. I mean, they eat exactly three times than any month of the year. And they say, Ramadan Kareem. Ramadan is generous, so we have to eat a lot. After the month of Ramadan is over, they start doing diet to lose weight. Now, something strange about the timing of fast. The Quran says you fast as long as there's daytime. I still see through the windows, there's daytime outside. When it gets dark, that, that, then you start eating. Now, what happened if the month of Ramadan happened uh, to come in, say, in Christmas time, uh, December 16, 18, and before Christmas, and you just happen to be living in Alaska or Greenland? How many hours you'll be fasting during this first week or so? It's dark all day, all night. It's, it's the whole thing is night. So you just go and eat. What happened if Ramadan happened to come in the, you, in the month of June and you live in Alaska or Greenland? You're talking a whole week. You're going to eat nothing. And when it gets dark, it's going to be only 15 minutes. You need to eat as fast as you can. You see, it's a problem. The timing set for the Muslim to pray and to fast and all this does not work. But Muslim people fast the month of Ramadan. When is the last time did you really fast? Do you remember? Was it because somebody was about to die sick? When you take it serious and you go before the Lord and you fast. Do we have enough reasons or things to fast for in America? in our churches, in our country, in our state, in our city. I mean, if you think about reasons for you to fast, man, you, will not be, you should not be eating at all. There's so many reasons for us to fast. But we are not fasting. We do not have brokenness before God Almighty to heal our country, to heal our land, to, just for your own personal walk with Christ. Will you make a commitment tonight to fast and pray and give? And testify for your face. Hajj. Hajj is a little bit different now. See, in Ramadan, when you fast the month of Ramadan, you receive forgiveness for your sin up to the month of Ramadan. Now, when you do the Hajj, now you receive forgiveness of all your sin, past and present and future. All your sin will be forgiven. 
if somebody die in your family, you can go and visit for them later. And they will receive forgiveness for their sin too. And now you think, wow, now all my sin is forgiven. That means I can get to heaven. No! Heaven has nothing to do with sin. Heaven is for those whom God chooses, and hell is for those whom God chooses too. You visit Mecca one time in your life, you receive forgiveness for your sin. This is a pillar of Islam. That's where Islam stands, how Islam stands firm. Second pillar is Dawah. Dawah is sharing your faith with others, Muslimizing America. They're here in America, and they have enough people to, dis to, to literally destroy this country by their lies or by their action. They're not, they're not dressed like Imam, like you think in Egypt, with big beard and big hat. They dress like me. They change so much to become American, to reach out to American to Islam. They have the name Brother John and Brother Smith and Brother Mark, and they dress in a suit and a tie, and they say, ladies and gentlemen, and they can even have ladies inside the mosque. They're singing to Muhammad with a guitar. In Egypt, if you sing, that's a no, no, that's a sin. Here's, I heard on YouTube, I'm watching this music, and say, we love you, Muhammad. I mean, they're singing to Muhammad like, we love you, Jesus. They're changing completely to deceive you into the new religion of Islam. 600 plus thousand students in America today. They're not here to get a degree from your country because they can't even read English. Most of the students, they don't come from Arab countries. They came from all over the Muslim world. They are paid by Saudi Wahhabi money to come to America to marry your children and make you a Muslim nation. They can't, even, can't we make at least common sense a, a student who have a bachelor degree from Egypt or from Saudi Arabia or from Pakistan or from Afghanistan or from India coming to study to get a master's degree in America? Don't you think they should pass the level of Prep school to speak English? Can't, don't you think you should at least speak English? No. They're just here to have four or five years visa. Hopefully during this four or five years, they're going to fall in love with one of your daughters, and they marry to them, and here we go. And other people became citizens in this country. This is your neighbor, garage door. Mr. and Mrs. whatever name you want to give to them. Smith. And you go by their garage door every day as you come into the church here on Sunday. And they know that you go into the church. And you wave at them, hello, Mr. Smith, hi, Mr. And then later at 12, 31 o'clock, you're coming back from church, and you wave at them again. And you never invite them to come here to be with us, to worship with us. You never tell them about Jesus. You just go by Sunday after Sunday, one Sunday after Sunday, and one Sunday you went by their home, and you can't tell the house is on fire. Literally, you can smell the smoke from inside your car. And you look at, wow, look at that. Honey, their house is on fire. Yeah, baby, I know, but we're running late for the church. But, honey, can't you, don't worry, honey, do you have insurance, all state insurance, a good insurance? But what if the fire goes inside the house that's only in the garage right now? Don't worry, honey. Alarm off will go off anytime. They will dial 911. Insurance money, they can even remodel the whole house. Well, we're running late. No, we have to be in the church. Will you do that? Guess what? American church need to know that's exactly what you're doing. Every Sunday, come into the church, go and buy your neighbor homes. What happens if Mr. or Mrs. Smith die while you're in the church service? Where is they going to spend their eternity? It's in hell. And you are responsible for your neighbors. Love your neighbor as yourselves. I know all the excuses we can give to them. There is, every house in America has five Bibles. As a matter of fact, if they just open the TV, they will see Billy Graham or, or some big preacher speaking on the TV. I know they know about it, but you are commanded by Christ. To love your neighbor, to ask your neighbor about the relationship with Christ, to share the gospel with your neighbor, to lead your neighbor to Christ, to bring your neighbor to the God's house after they've been saved. Jihad. Remember in, in Florida, I speak to this Muslim student there, and they told me, Jihad is not a pillar. I said, man, oh man, Jihad is the most important pillar in Islam. You see, how is that? I said, if you practice the first five pillars you're teaching in our, in our school here, 
What is the chance for a person who practices the first five pillars to get to heaven? How about zero, slim, nothing? But if you perform jihad and you die for the sake of God, what is the chance for you to get to heaven? How about 100%? One, the only guarantee for a Muslim to get to heaven is to die while they're performing jihad for the sake of Allah. Listen to this video. You and I sitting here, in their interpretation, I should take out a sword, put it on your neck and say, do you accept Islam or not? And if you don't, I cut off your head. That's what a jihadist would, 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 would do. People see us as extremists because we don't compromise the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We accept it with every word and every utterance of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that no Muslim can turn away from one ayah of the Quran, one verse of the Quran. If we don't accept this, we actually become disbelievers. We must prepare to die now, but to take vengeance Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned jihad in the Quran 26 times and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned kital fi sibilillah 79 times. Kital fi sibilillah is fighting by a physical fighting. You see, the first man, he was from Saudi Arabia and he said it clearly, that is what jihadists would do. They put the sword above your head and say, do you believe Islam or not? If you don't believe in Islam, they cut off your head. That's what jihadists would do. The second gentleman here we're talking to here is a British man who was born from a British mom and a British dad who became a Muslim just 18 years ago. Now he's imam and he's preaching this message of hate in the streets of London. We must prepare to die, but to take vengeance. It's our right. God has given us the right to defend ourselves. God has given us the right to kill and perform jihad. 26 times the Quran says perform jihad. He knows it. 79 times kital fisabillah to physically die for the sake of God. That is Islam. This is a born again Muslim. He believe what he teach. And what he teach is the truth match the word of the Quran. He teach what is written. When they start teaching jihad, they teach jihad for little kids, little children overseas and here in America. We already got four or five schools, Muslim schools in America, teaching kids jihad. Women in Iran and men all over the Muslim world. They used to, this picture I take from Palestine, this Palestinian people used to throw rock on the soldiers, the Jewish soldiers. Now they don't use rock anymore. They use weapon. What does the Quran teach about those who die for the sake of God? and do not consider those who were killed for the sake of Allah as dead, yet they are alive with their Lord, receiving their provision. When you die in jihad, you don't die. You're immediately alive in heaven. The first drop of blood come of a Muslim man in jihad will take all his sin away, wipe his sin away, will enter him to paradise, take the pain of the tomb out. It will cause him to intercede for 70 people of his own people. This, that's why when a man performs jihad and commits suicide in our country, we say, pass candy. They're celebrating his martyrism. Because he went to heaven and also the first drop of blood will meet him with his 72 virgin. And that's the smallest number. And the largest number in the hadith is 700. Here in chapter 9, 20 and 21, read, listen to these two verses, please. Those who believed and emigrated and performed jihad for the sake of Allah with their money and with their lives of the highest degree with Allah, and those are the triumphant. Their Lord gives them good news of mercy from himself and of his good pleasure and gardens. They will have in it everlasting bliss. Here is another good verse in the Quran. Chapter 47, the same verse, by the way, he said, chop off their head. That's the rest of the verse here. He said, and those who were killed for the sake of Allah, so he will not let their works go astray. He will guide them and reform their condition, and he will admit them into the garden of which he made known to them. 
That's about how Muslim people really believe in performing jihad and what happens when you die as you perform jihad. You immediately get to heaven, you enter the paradise, and you have the wonderful life forever. What did Rush Limbo's brother Dave Limbo says about the war against Islam? The war against Islamofascism is not a war for the hearts and minds of the terrorist. They cannot be persuaded or appeased. Their principal beef with us is not our support of Israel or even our counter-aggression against them. The problem inheres in our infidelity. Short of wholesale national conversion to radical Islam, we can probably expect a decades-long war. It's not gonna, this is just the beginning. It will continue until Christ comes back. Obviously, uh, brother Dave Limbo, he's a Christian brother. He goes to a church in uh, Cape Girardeau, Missouri. And I know about his church. And he totally believed that this war will never stop. It will start, it's just to start, and it will continue forever. And it's built on the, Christ, on the Quranic verses, which has come from chapter 8, verse 39. What does the Quran teach about this war? He says, And engage in war with them until there will not be sedition, and the religion will be completely to Allah. So, if they cease, so surely Allah sees what they do. See, here is the command in the Quran. They must continue fight until Islam take over the world. They could not do it early because they have no the power to fight, but now they do have the power to fight. And wait until Iran has a nuclear weapon. They, if you don't become Muslim, they, they just will wipe you out. This is their heart. Now you know the president of Iran, when he look at the camera and smile, and he say, we love you, American people. We Muslims teach love and peace. Did you know what his book teach? The president of Iran, Mahmoud Abdel Najab, know exactly what the Quran teach. But he smile in front of your camera and say he love you. He can be even our friend. Question. Some enemies of the religion claim that Islam was spread by the sword. What is your response to that? Islam was spread by proof and evidence, in the case of those who listened to the message and responded to it. And it was spread by strength and the sword in the case of those who stubbornly resisted, until they had no choice and had to submit to the new reality. In other words, Islam is spread by the sword. What is evidence they have for us even today? There is no evidence or any proof to, to, for the existence of such a religion or faith. Well, here is not only Islam spread by the sword. One last slide here. In, in Morocco, the law in the land there, you must be Muslim. And if you are Muslim, you cannot leave Islam. And if you leave Islam, they will kill you. If a Muslim says, I have embraced another religion instead of Islam, before he is called to repentance, he will be brought before a group of medical specialists so that they can examine him to see if he is still in his right mind. After he has then been called to repentance, but decides to hold fast to the testimony of another religion not coming from Allah, that is, not Islam, he will be judged. Allah's Messenger said, The blood of a Muslim cannot be shed except in three cases, for murder, adultery, and the one who reverts from Islam and leaves the Muslims. This is the sad thing about Islam. It is not what they teach us here in America, loving, peaceful. When this country fall into Islam, they will practice Islamic law here. Right now, they are not practicing Islamic law in Egypt because of America. You are protecting the Christian in Egypt right now. But can you imagine when Islam take over America? Who will protect the Christian in the world? Who will protect the Christian in America? That will be a sad day. Here is a wonderful verse of Islam, peace. The only verse in the Quran which teach peace. It teach no peace. The Quran says, So do not be weak and do not call for peace when you have the upper hand. And Allah is with you and he will not leave from you for your work. When Muslims are not in the upper hand, when Muslims are not strong enough, they will cry for peace. But when they have the upper hand, the Quran commands them not to cry for peace. Right now in America, they are so loving, so peaceful people like it was in Europe 50 years ago. But what happened in Europe? They're telling the people in England, we're going to practice Sharia law, Islam. And if you don't like it, you're welcome to leave. Yes, British people can come to America today, but if they practice the same law in America, where you will go? To the water? Islam versus Christianity. Islam is a religion which teach you to send your sons and daughter to die for God. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a faith in which Christ, the Son of God, came to die on the cross for your sin. 
Jesus died that we may have life and we have abundantly. I had one, this wonderful message from your pastor this morning. You can have forgiveness of your sin. You can be set free. You can be justified because of what Jesus did on the cross. And what my wife said, and uh, we have eaten lunch today, has really caught my attention. I would like to add it to or repeat it to you. But also, you may leave the court as a criminal and spend eternity behind the bar because you refuse to receive the gift of the judge of eternal life or the gift to be set free. Jesus came and he down the cross for your sin. He came that you may have life and have it abundantly. He pay for your sin. But what happens if you refuse his gift? You must pay for your sin too. Justification has been given in fall on the cross for our sin. But the moment you say no to Jesus and you die without Jesus, you will spend eternity in hell. You can be set free. You can be justified because of what Jesus did. If you only, if you accept what Jesus did for you on the cross. But you may come to the church one time after one time. You hear the message one time after one time. And you never make a commitment in your heart for Jesus. You know what's going to happen? You spend eternity in hell. The justification is not free gift for everybody. It's for those who accept the gift of the death of Christ on the cross for your behalf. Have you ever think about your eternity? Have you ever think about all your sin and the punishment for your sin? See, the Bible is very clear. The wages of sin is death. And death in the Bible is three levels of death, that I believe personally. Death spiritually, that's when you live in sin, you have no problem at all. And this physically, that's when you die, we bury you and you go under the ground. And this eternally, that's when you spend eternity in hell. Did you receive the forgiveness of your sin? Have you accepted Christ? If not, why not tonight? You know, we can learn all what we can learn this week about Islam. And we have a lot bigger head and more information. But you cannot love the Muslim people until you have the love of Christ in your heart. And my heart desire is not to teach you about Islam, it's to teach you to love the Muslim people and reach out to the Muslim people. They are here in Biloxi. Some of them are going to be married to your children or your grandchildren. Why can't we reach out to them and teach them about love of Christ? But if you don't have it, you can give it. You can't love the Muslim people on your own. I can't myself. It's only because of what Jesus did for me. We cannot be true Christian if we don't love our neighbors. We can't be true Christian if we don't uh, reach out to the lost around us. And you can't do all this unless you have a relationship with Christ. Do you remember the time and the place where you give your heart to Jesus? The second verse is equal to the first verse. You were born physically in some place. And you were born physically at specific time. Some of us are 20 years old, 40 years old, 60 years old. You were born physically some place in specific time. So is spiritually. Do you remember the time and the place where you give your heart to Jesus? If not, you are no different than any Muslim. You can die a good, great Baptist and spend eternity in hell. Baptist does not mean you're saved. A born-again Christian means you're saved. You think about that. The Straight Way of Grace ministry hopes that you were informed and blessed by this presentation. Muslims in America are teaching that Islam is a loving, peaceful religion. But that is not what we found in the verses of the Quran. For it is full of hate toward Jews, Christians, and any others who do not believe in Islam. They also teach that Muhammad is a prophet. However, when reading the Quran, we cannot find any prophecy ever given by Muhammad, let alone any fulfilled prophecies. God promises eternal life for all those who will put their trust in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. Our sincere desire is that you would come to know the love of God and to experience the forgiveness of sins that he provides through Jesus Christ. If you have not yet trusted in Christ, would you pray a prayer like this one? Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I confess all my sins to you and ask that you forgive me. I believe that you died for my sins and I want to turn from my sins. Thank you for forgiving me. Now I ask you to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. I confess you as the Lord and Savior of my life. I give you my life, and I ask that you would give me your Holy Spirit 
to take control of my life from this point on. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Other presentations in this series cover a wide variety of topics, from a comparison of the Bible and the Quran, through Jesus and Muhammad, to women in Islam. For a current listing of available presentations, to schedule presentations for your church or organization, or to find other helpful information, go to the ministry's website at www.thestraightway.org.